Hello, pragmatists. Chris Potts here. Welcome to part three in our series of screencasts on Gricean pragmatics. The first screencast provided general background, and the second screencast gave an overview of the cooperative principle and the maxims of conversation. For this screencast, we're going to move through the maxims one by one, and we're going to use this clash, opt-out, flout categorization that I established last time to help structure our discussion. And my hope is that by the end of all this, it'll be clear to you how the maxims work and how they interact, and how those interactions might be a source for pragmatic enrichment. And that will set us up nicely to address the notion of conversational implicature that Grice defined. In section 3.1 here, we begin with the maxim of quality. To help you remember it and distinguish it from the other Q maxim quantity, I've glossed it here as be truthful, but do remember that evidence is really important as well. Now, quality is a fundamental pressure. Cooperative speakers obey it at all costs and for obvious reasons. If we get too lax on quality, then what we say can't be trusted and communication quickly breaks down, right? Without guarantees on truthfulness, there's just no point in listening to what other people have to say. We are, though, allowed to be a little lax on quality, especially in specific kinds of contexts. But by and large, we have to obey quality and we have to assume that others are obeying quality as well. My second major point is one I've already emphasized. It's the evidential aspect of this maxim. If you accidentally say something true, but you don't have access to supporting evidence, you don't really satisfy the quality maxim. And we generally regard this kind of thing as mere luck with regard to the truth, and so not something that can be trusted. Evidence is key. Let's think now about our clash opt-out flout framework. So for clashes, we'll study clashes with quality in depth as we introduce more maxims. And as you can imagine, quality tends to win if there is a clash. For opting out, this too is not easy because uh, quality is so fundamental. If you just announce that you're not gonna be truthful, then no one will listen to you. And if you opt out without telling anyone, then you'll get yourself into some trouble eventually, I suspect. I suppose we could consider acting and other forms of performance as opting out, but I think this really doesn't explain much. Um, so perhaps the best examples of opting out in a pragmatic way are when we have things like brainstorming sessions where we collectively agree to partially opt out of quality for the sake of generating new ideas. And then you can be lax in terms of evidence and commitment without being regarded as fundamentally uncooperative in the Gricean sense. Finally, flouting. Here again, it's hard to see how to flout quality, but perhaps these examples in one through six are relevant. You have fixed phrases like, yeah, and I'm a monkey's uncle. Um, this is meant to signal disbelief in what the other person said, and I suppose that arises via a juxtaposition of the other person's claim with your obviously absurd claim. Irony and sarcasm, that's another area where we see apparent violations, and Grice does invoke the maxim of quality in this context. Now, I think quality alone doesn't provide an explanatory account of irony and sarcasm, but it might be an ingredient. Here's a similar case, the exclamation, in your dreams, as in, you'll win the Nobel Prize, in your dreams, right? This conveys disbelief. It's a quality violation, at least insofar as I have no access to your dreams, and so I can't possibly have the needed evidence for saying that. Uh, and in that way, I guess disbelief is signaled. And metaphor and hyperbole, these are additional cases of non-literal language use. These are cases where what is literally said is a quality violation, and so some other meaning emerges as the one that gets communicated. Let's move now to quantity, which I've loosely glossed here as be informative. I find the statement of quantity to be a little unusual in the context of the full set of maxims. Quantity asks speakers to strike a balance between providing new information and providing too much new information. And in my view, the second clause overlaps with the maxim of relevance. And so I'm kind of inclined to focus on the first clause, be informative. Um, but this isn't so crucial in the grand scheme of things. As I said before, quantity regulates the amount of information conveyed. Importantly, long utterances are not necessarily contentful, and short utterances can be highly contentful. So it's really the maxim of manner that regulates, say, the length of an utterance. One of the best studied kinds of clash concerns quality and quantity. This is a source of a lot of pragmatic meaning. Consider the utterance Sue's work was good as an evaluation of her work in general. 
Quantity is a pressure to go as high as you can on this scale of adjectives since they get progressively more informative. So why not go higher than good and do better on quantity, so to speak? Well, this would be a clash with quality, presumably. To go higher on the scale might be to say something false. And your audience will know this, and so they'll conclude from your choice of good that you couldn't go higher on the scale. And a good guess about why you couldn't go higher on the scale is that quality got in your way. That is, you believe Sue's work isn't excellent or outstanding. Now, this might seem very automatic in this context, but it's definitely pragmatic. Imagine that the context is not one of fully reporting on Sue's work, but rather say you just need to fill out a simple form that asks the question, was the student's work satisfactory? And there are only two options, yes or no. Here, you won't hesitate to pick yes, even if you believe her work was outstanding, because the context is this simple binary one. Let's look at another clash that involves quantity. This is from the radio show Car Talk. One of the hosts read the following joke purportedly taken from an evaluation sheet filled in by students at the end of a college course. <clears throat> the sheet says, how would you describe the quality of the textbook? And the response was very high. It is printed on the very best paper and beautifully bound. Now, I'm not totally sure I understand this joke. If the joke is that the student never bothered to open the book, then this is a quantity quality clash, right? The student doesn't have the evidence needed to provide the sort of information that the form is asking for, and so they provide this pretty meager information instead. Another option is that the student thinks the book is really bad and they have the evidence for it. So this would be maybe a quantity politeness clash. That's sometimes called damning with faint praise, right? In doing poorly on quantity, one indicates that stronger things that should be said might be too rude or shocking or unwelcome somehow to actually say. One more clash. This one is definitely a quantity politeness clash. In recommendation letters, at this point, it's almost transgressive to say negative things very directly. And so the negative things have to emerge pragmatically. And here's my little masterpiece of this. And I confess that this is also exploiting a lot of fun ambiguities. And so the maximum of manner is involved as well. But so here it is. We are pleased to say that Landry is a former colleague of ours. All in all, we cannot say enough good things about him. He has excellent penmanship and he always arrives to meetings on time. You will be fortunate indeed if you can get him to work for you. Now, I confess that it's really the penmanship and punctuality that damn with faint praise here. So those show the interesting clash. The other things are amusing ambiguities, I hope. What about opting out of quantity? This would be where one deliberately refuses to provide relevant information. You see this a lot in political life. For example, no comment and I plead the fifth are conventionalized devices for signaling that one won't be providing information. The fifth here is the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which includes the right to avoid incriminating oneself. So via a very predictable pragmatic process, invoking this right sends a signal that one has done something incriminating. But the pragmatic inference there is likely better than directly providing the incriminating information. Mistakes were made is a bit subtler. This hides the agent, the person who made the mistakes. And this is almost always relevant where there are mistakes worth discussing. So this passivized form without an agent is a pretty direct way of trying to opt out of quantity. Finally, flouting of quantity. Uh, any utterance that's always true, that is any tautology, will do poorly on quantity because we already knew it was true even before the utterance began. So if you say war is war or boys will be boys, your listeners will look for alternative construals of what you said since they'll assume that your apparent blatant quantity violation is motivated somehow. I think examples like a phone is a phone are especially interesting examples of this. They convey something like indifference about which phone one uses. And this construal might be instigated somehow by the apparent quantity violation, but I want to emphasize that quantity alone won't explain where it comes from or what its nature is. So there's definitely something more happening here. Finally, many indirect speech acts can be understood in part via quantity. Consider a case like, can you pass the salt? If the salt is within reach of the addressee, then the answer is yes, and we all know it. And so this is a sort of quantity violation that comes from asking a question. So we end up with an alternative construal where it's a request for the salt. 
right? And we'll take a very particular context for the literal interpretation of this question to reemerge, right? But um, just imagine that the addressee has broken two arms and is having trouble doing things, then asking them, can you pass the salt, might be a real question about their abilities. In other words, the literal construal does arise where the answer has the potential to be informative. The case of could you open the window please is similar and the possibility of using please here suggests that the apparent question has maybe been partly conventionalized as a request. The example of do you know what time it is is perhaps subtly different. So the literal construal is one where it's asking for about the speaker's knowledge of the time. But this is unlikely to be informative or relevant. And you can actually see that by noting that saying yes in response and not giving the time is a sort of rude joke, right? Try it with your friends and see, they'll be quite ticked off. So we naturally adjust our construal of this question to be something more like, what time is it? And as, as often the case, being a little indirect is generally more polite. Okay, on to relevance, the maxim that says be relevant. So the core question is, well, relevant to what? And my proposal is that we assume that speakers are working to address some questions under discussion. And these might be highly abstract questions that we can't really articulate, but they're nonetheless present. And to be relevant is to offer information that helps resolve those questions. In addition, I would say that relevance is a very fundamental pressure. It's in fact so strong that if you try to break free of it, people are still likely to assume that you're abiding by it. And so they'll work overtime to make what you said actually relevant to the topic or question at hand. So for example, if you ask me, do we have a quiz this week? And I reply, hmm, it's supposed to rain. Then you'll work hard to find some kind of inferential connection between the rain and the quiz. And of course, this is something that deceptive speakers can exploit, right? You might conclude that rain relates to quizzes, but I could say that I was just distracted or musing out loud about the weather report and therefore deny the connection that you made, even if I kind of knew that you would make it. A third high level note, as I noted earlier, quantity mentions what's required. Uh, in practice, this means that it overlaps with relevance. So one approach is to simplify quantity so that it simply says be informative with the excesses handled by relevance. All right, let's look at some clashes between relevance and other maxims. The first case is from the TV show Monk. Uh, in this context, the characters are reviewing Mr. Monk. He earlier had a nervous breakdown and they need to determine whether he's ready to be put back on the police force. And importantly, Stottlemyre is Monk's friend and former captain. So the commission member says, is Mr. Monk ready to be put back on the force? And Stottlemyre replies, Mr. Monk has excellent instincts. Yes, but is he ready to be reinstated? Stottlemyer, he is an excellent investigator. And here the commission member gets impatient. Captain, please. What we see here is that Stottlemyer is struggling with relevance and quality. He would like to avoid providing information that will keep his friend off the force, but he can't lie and say that Monk's ready. And so he seeks instead to provide information that is only partially relevant. And here it doesn't work as a strategy. The commission member pushes for a direct answer. I like 17 as well. This was a student submission. I would describe it as a clash between relevance and quality as well. A says, yeah, let's not bother. It's not like we're going broke or something. And B replies, perhaps jokingly, yeah, we're rich, aren't we? Now to avoid having to give a direct no answer, A instead replies, we're rich in heart. So that's strictly speaking, not on topic as it were, given what B said, but it avoids a perhaps painful truth. What about opting out? So opting out of relevance can be hard given that it's such a fundamental pressure. Here's an attempt that emerges as a sort of joke. Uh, question, how do I put this table together? Answer, very carefully. This reply obviously doesn't resolve the question that we know was raised. And so it's blunt about the fact that it seems like B just isn't genuinely trying to be relevant. They've opted out of relevance. For flouting of relevance, Grace gives an amusing example. Suppose that A and B are talking with a mutual friend C who's now working at a bank. A asks B how C is getting on at his job and B replies, oh, quite well, I think. He likes his colleagues and he hasn't been to prison yet. Now, absent a lot of common ground between A and B about C, this is gonna to lead to a lot of follow-up questions given that 
he hasn't been to prison yet seems on the face of it to be totally irrelevant to the issue that A raised. Let's turn now to our final official Gricean maxim, the maxim of manner. As I said earlier, it has four subclauses: avoid obscurity, avoid ambiguity, be brief, and be orderly. All of these regulate the forms that we use, the specific word choices and phrasings and so forth, and we can separate this from the information that we manage to convey with those words and phrases. The statement of manner makes it apparent that we can't satisfy all of its subclauses all of the time because there are actually tensions internal to the subclauses of manner. For instance, short utterances tend to be ambiguous, and avoiding ambiguities often requires long sentences. I also in this context want to briefly mention a related heuristic that doesn't quite follow from the maxim of manner but draws on similar intuitions. This is the kind of associative generalization that says normal events are reported with normal language and unusual events are reported with unusual language. We'll return to that when we talk about conversational implicature in particular. To start, let's consider a manner internal clash of sorts. I've called this being orderly with and. Example 20a is a funny story. I got into bed and brushed my teeth. It seems like this person brushed their teeth in bed. Example 20b is the more normal variant. I brushed my teeth and got into bed. Now, is this a semantic fact about and that it conveys the order in which things happened? I'd say certainly not. First, one can consistently deny this ordering, as in 20c, I got into bed and brushed my teeth, but not in that order. And sentences that aren't inventive in this narrative way are unlikely to convey ordering effects at all, right? I took pragmatics and I took syntax doesn't entail that the courses were taken in that order, and Germany is in Europe and Canada is in North America doesn't say anything about the order in which the countries were founded or whatever. And we can account for the ordering effects that we do see in cases like 20 A and B via the direct pressure of manner be orderly. Now, it creates ambiguities that could be avoided with and then or just then, but and is more natural and colloquial and it's maybe shorter. And so it's easy to see why 20 A and 20 B might emerge as the default way to report events like this, even though they depend on this pragmatic inference. Let's look at a case that might be ambiguous between flouting and opting out of manner avoid obscurity. The example is, to show that she is pleased, Sue contracts her zygomatic major muscle and her orbicularis oculi muscle. I think this is a true description of what it means to smile anatomically. Now this could convey that Sue's smiles are robotic or something, and that would be flouting of avoid obscurity. However, the speaker might be opting out of avoid obscurity, say, to convey something about their own expertise, or maybe to teach people about these specialized anatomical terms or something. So I suppose the context and knowledge of the speaker of 21A will help us figure this out. A final case in 22, I think we have a clear flouting of be brief to convey negative affect. Soap opera star Rachel Singer produced a series of sounds corresponding closely to the score of an aria from Rigoletto. Why didn't the writer just choose the shorter form sing? Right here we could invoke our related heuristic from earlier. Sing is the usual language and would convey a normal singing event. The above uses unusual language instead to convey an unusual singing event. Now, I'm not sure where the negative affect comes from, but perhaps there's also an interaction here with politeness and quality. Okay, to wrap this up, I feel I should mention politeness, perhaps the main missing maxim. The pressure to be polite can be powerful. In some situations and in some cultures, it can overwhelm all the other pragmatic pressures resulting in utterances that are, for example, overly long, violating manner, and underinformative, which would violate quantity. Here are some examples that come to mind from my own life. So suppose I have a distinguished guest on campus and we're trying to walk to my department, but my guest seems to be going in slightly the wrong direction. So I say, I think this is the right way. Now, I know it's the right way. Why was I hedging with I think? It's because I can help my addressee save face by minimizing the apparent difference between my knowledge and expertise and theirs. Or consider utterances like, sorry to bother you, but might you have the time uh, when you want to make a simple request? So here you might be trying or acting as if you're trying to provide the addressee with a graceful way 
of declining your request by acting like it's a large burden. This pays a big cost in terms of manner since the utterance is so much longer than it needs to be. And maybe there's even a quality violation coming from the false pretense that the request is a real burden. But these social fictions help achieve politeness effects, even if we all recognize them as social fictions for the sake of politeness. And indeed, oddly, recognizing that they're politeness efforts, and so not genuine in other senses, can actually enhance the politeness effect. So clearly, politeness is deep and mysterious, and I can't do it justice here. But I do encourage you to consider politeness as an ingredient in your own pragmatic explanations.